Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Distinguished Service Cross Award Ceremony, honoring former Army Captain Andrew Bunderman. Presiding over today's ceremony is the Commanding General, 1st United States Army, Lieutenant General Thomas S. James, Jr. Please, join me in welcoming the distinguished guests who we are honored to have with us today. Please hold your applause until all our guests have been introduced. This is Katie Bunderman, Andrew Bunderman's wife, and their children, Wyatt, Elliot, and Charlotte. Andrew's parents, Mr. Lawrence Bunderman and Mrs. Donna Bunderman. Mr. Jeremy Bunderman and his wife, Andrea, Andrew's brother and sister-in-law, and their children, George and Oscar. Andrew's brother, Nicholas Bunderman, his wife, Lindsay, and their daughters, Madison and Emma. Mr. Ted Erickson, Andrew's brother-in-law. Staff Sergeant Retired Clint Romache, Section Sergeant in Troop B, 3rd Squadron, 61st Cavalry Regiment, and Medal of Honor recipient for his actions on 3 October 2009. Brigadier General William L. Thigpen, Acting Senior Commander, 4th Infantry Division and Fort Carson. Command Sergeant Major Tony Hillig, Command Sergeant Major, 4th Infantry Division and Fort Carson Rear Detachment. Colonel Brad Brown, 3rd Squadron, 61st Cavalry Regiment, Squadron Commander during the actions on 3 October 2009. Colonel David Zinn, Commander, 2nd Infantry Brigade Combat Team, 4th Infantry Division. Major Stoney Portis, Commander of B Troop, 3rd Squadron, 61st Cavalry Regiment during the actions on 3 October 2009. Major Blake Richter, Executive Officer, 3rd Squadron, 61st Cavalry Regiment and Mr. Cal Barr, Minnesota State Representative. The music for today's ceremony is provided by the 4th Infantry Division Band, led by Sergeant First Class, Tony Teos. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the national anthem and invocation given by the 4th Infantry Division Chaplain Chaplain Colonel Robert Glazner. Lieutenant General James is dedicating his honors to the service and sacrifice of the eight soldiers killed in action at Combat Outpost Keating on 3 October 2009 and to their families. <laughs> Protect and save the lives of the soldiers at Cop Keating. 
His sacrifice is the lineage of our nation's freedom and all of its accomplishment. It is a privilege to gather today with Andrew, Katie, and the rest of the family to remember and tell Andrew's story of strength, courage, and love of family and freedom. We ask you to give Andrew endurance as he strengthens his love to his community and his family. Allow this award to be a reminder and example for others to follow to build a strong foundation for our nation and its army. Let those who still serve, serve with the memory of Andrew's courage and character. He stood in the gap and protected his brothers and provided freedom to America. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain Blazer. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. The Distinguished Service Cross, also known as the DSC, was established by President Woodrow Wilson on January 2nd, 1918. General John J. Pershing, Commander-in-Chief of the American Expeditionary Forces of France, had recommended that recognition other than the Medal of Honor be authorized for the Armed Forces of the United States for valorous service rendered in like manner to that awarded by the European armies. The Distinguished Service Cross is the second highest military decoration that can be awarded to a member of the United States Army. Today we have the distinct honor of presenting this prestigious award to former Army Captain Andrew L. Bunderman. Andrew Bunderman was commissioned into the United States Army as an infantry officer through the Reserve Officers Training Corps program here at the University of Minnesota in May of 2007. He deployed in support of Operation Enduring Freedom and was assigned to the 61st Cavalry Regiment. Then First Lieutenant Bunderman served as the ground force commander during the attack on combat outpost Keating on 3 October 2009. This battle, known as the Battle of Kandesh, stands as one of the bloodiest days of the Afghanistan War. 54 American soldiers defended combat outpost Keating against 300 enemy. He was awarded the Silver Star for his actions in the Battle of Kandesh on 9 April 2010. Captain Bunderman received an honorable discharge from the Army on 1 August 2012. Following the completion of a year-long military decorations and awards review, the Secretary of the Army has made the determination that Andrew Bunderman's award be upgraded to the Distinguished Service Cross. It is now my pleasure to introduce Major Stoney Portis, former commander of Troop B, 3rd Squadron, 61st Cavalry Regiment. In 2009, I had only recently taken command of B Troop, but I was already impressed with the professional respect my lieutenants showed one another. They were an incredible team, the ideal ingredients to cook up a truly great combat unit. For example, I once asked one of Andrew Bunderman's fellow platoon leaders how he would describe Andrew to someone who had never met him before. Well, sir, the lieutenant paused, searching for just the right words to describe one of his best friends. Everyone respects Bundy, and they also love to hate him. He's a skinny, wiry little dude with zero muscle at all, but he has a mouth like he's six foot five, 250 pounds, and could just dominate anybody. He's hands down the weirdest dude I've ever met. Well, I quickly realized that my platoon leader's deference toward one another had been a thin veneer that preluded a relationship filled with fun, laughter, healthy competition, and a deep sense of compassion and love, even, or perhaps especially, if it was at the expense of one another. Andrew was frequently the expense, like the time that someone put a goat in his bed while he was still sleeping in it. Uh, Andrew slept on the bottom bunk of a bunk bed, and they managed to trap him and the goat together by blocking the side of the bed with a sheet. I can still imagine those voices today saying, Andrew! <laughs> As does he. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm still convinced that Andrew was behind some of the greatest pranks of that deployment, like the time that our third platoon leader walked 200 meters across the fob for a shower only to find out that someone had replaced his body wash with fancy sauce. That's right, fancy sauce, one part ketchup mixed with one part mayonnaise, shaken, not stirred. 
I can't prove, and I don't know if anyone can, that it was Andrew, but it is curious that he's still laughing about it ten years later. In truth, I found the aforementioned description of Andrew to be remarkably accurate. That's because Andrew always spoke his mind. I could count on him to point out the flaws in my plan, or anybody's plan for that matter, even if it was sometimes delivered with a dose of sarcasm. But when it was time for him to do his job, he always did his very best, and as you might imagine, that means a great deal. It was qualities like these that made Andrew so likable and made his soldiers want to follow him in combat. It's also why I made him the ground force commander of our outpost while I went to our remote observation post on the mountaintop above. Unfortunately, the helicopter I was riding in took fire, and instead of dropping us off at the OP or back at Cop Keating, it banked to the south and flew to Fob Bostick on the other side of the mountains to drop us off before it limped back to Jalalabad. So there Andrew was, in early October, acting commander of the outpost on the eve of one of the biggest battles of the war in Afghanistan. And if you've read the narrative to Andrew's Silver Star, or if you've ever read about the battle, then you probably know about Andrew's leadership that day. But if you weren't there, or if you weren't part of the unit, then you might not know the rest of the story. You might not know that in the early morning hours before the attack, the Taliban had taken control of the Afghan police station, which lay 150 meters to the north of Kop Keating. The Afghan police were part of the coalition, so Andrew couldn't figure out why they were firing at him. It was Andrew who had to make the tough call to fire back at and drop munitions on the police station, neutralizing what could have been, but wasn't, an unwitting ally confused by the fog of war. Or you might not know that enemy mortar rounds and RPGs impacted the outpost an average of every 20 seconds for the first two hours of the battle. And that early in the fight, the enemy destroyed the outpost's communications, so Andrew had to rely on a tactical satellite radio as the sole form of communications to talk to the outside world. You might not know that the mortars at Cop Keating and O.P. Fritchie were pinned down for much of the battle, or that the M777 howitzers were just out of range of the outpost. And that Bundy and Case and Schrode, the fire support officer, developed a plan to fire the triple sevens in support of OP Fritchie, which was just within the artillery's max effective range. This relieved pressure from OP Fritchie, whose mortars could then support the besieged troopers on Keating. You might not know what it feels like to have bearded men in makeshift uniforms run across your camp, firing at close range the troop taking so many casualties that you have to make one of the most difficult decisions that you've ever made in your life, collapse the exterior positions, and form a stronghold at the center of camp, leaving your soldiers in those isolated positions alone to fit for themselves. You might not know how hard your heart can pound when you have to make the decision to drop a bomb on an enemy that is so close that you have to risk your soldiers' lives as well as your own, because it might land on you as well. You might not know that Bundy coordinated for a tight sequence of airstrikes that created something of a force field, which gave Brad Larson and Ty Carter time to evacuate a mortally wounded Stephen Mace, sprinting from their pinned down position on the west side of camp across nearly 100 meters of open terrain to the aid station. Or you might not know that Stephen had lost so much blood that he had lost consciousness and required a blood transfusion to stay alive. Andrew, being one of only a handful of soldiers who blood type, matched Stephens, donated a unit of his blood while he continued to command the fight at Keating, in the midst of the battle, to keep Stephen Mace alive. You might not know how heavy it feels to have led a company through a battle that killed over a hundred enemy combatants and injured an estimated hundred more, but in the process you lose eight of your own. And how for weeks and months after the battle, you relive it time and again, second-guessing every decision that you made. There's a phrase for that in the Army. It's called the weight of command. And you might not understand why it's difficult to accept that the only reason you and your surviving teammates are still alive is because of the decisions that you made and the leadership you provided during one of the darkest hours in your life. Andrew Bunderman knew all of these things because he lived them. I still remember the moment I first saw Bundy on October 3rd, 
Buildings all around us were covered in flames, and rounds of ammunition in those buildings popped off constantly. The fire was so intense that we were sweating from the heat, even though the weather was cool. I had just arrived with the quick reaction force, and I headed to the center of camp where I found Andrew standing outside his barracks. Bundy, you did a hell of a job, I said as I put my hand on his shoulder. Andrew did not say a word. He clenched his eyes shut, exhaled a deep breath, and just stood there. Silence. In truth, no words would have been sufficient to describe the thoughts and feelings that Bunderman's silence seemed to register. And I think after recounting what we might not know, it's easy to understand why. On December 13th, 2009, 10 weeks after the battle, I finally finished Andrew's award nomination for the Silver Star. I remember this because I had deliberately saved it for last. It was the last bit of paperwork I had to do to close out the battle. While the battle ended on October 3rd, the troop actually remained in Kandesh until October 8th. And when we finally arrived to Fort Operating Base Bostic in Mass, there were understandably a lot of things to do. We had another seven months of deployment remaining, and according to contemporaneous military doctrine, a unit is combat ineffective when it dips below 60% of its authorized personnel strength or 70% of its equipment strength. B Troop was well below that threshold for equipment, and Andrew's platoon was deficient in both. We replaced uniforms, personnel gear, and troop equipment. We memorialized our fallen comrades, we distributed personnel, and integrated replacements. We submitted 83 Valorous Awards, 18 of which were Bronze Stars for Valor and 9 were Silver Stars, let alone the 27 Purple Hearts and numerous combat infantrymen, combat action, and combat med medical badges that the troop categorically received. And why do I tell you all this? And why did I wait until the end to finally submit Andrew's Silver Star? Well, there are two reasons. First, it provided important perspective to the fact that Andrew's position and performance in the Battle of Kandesh had reverberations that our troop felt in the weeks, months, and years that followed the battle. When you talk about his actions on October 3rd, you have to understand that they had a lasting impact on the troop, and I wanted a better sense of that. Second, the weight of Andrew's actions were difficult to measure. He had exhibited tactical genius and amazing heroism, but his actions in the battle were so different from the conventional type of valor that the other soldiers demonstrated by pulling triggers, carrying injured soldiers, and quite frankly, getting shot at and blown up. I realize now, in ways that I couldn't have then, that there's no way I could have gotten everything right. But it was important to me to get Andrew the award that he deserved, because his actions somehow conveyed something about the troop as a whole that no other individual soldier's actions could. So, when I heard that Andrew's award was getting upgraded to the Distinguished Service Cross, I was relieved and proud to know that the Army saw Andrew's heroism during the Battle of Kandesh in much the same way that our soldiers and I have ever since. He was absolutely indispensable. His performance was central to the success of the entire troop, the entire battle. So would it surprise you to know that when I told Andrew in 2009 that I was nominating him for the Silver Star, that he told me that he thought it was a bad idea? There was no sarcasm in his voice. And this wasn't because he thought that the award should be higher, like it most certainly is worthy of, but because he thought he didn't deserve one at all. Andrew isn't motivated by awards or distinctions or honors. And furthermore, when you ask him about that day, he will insist on talking about the men who made the ultimate sacrifice. He will never mention himself. Gallegos, Griffin, Hart, Kirk, Mace, Hartman, Scusa, and Thompson. He'll tell you time and again that that's the narrative of the Battle of Alki, the Battle of Camden. But I would be remiss if I didn't close by bringing attention to the most important motivators in Andrew's life, both during the battle and ever since. Katrina, Wyatt, Elliot, and Charlotte. 
Wyatt, Elliot, and Charlotte, your dad is an American hero. But no one has ever doubted that. More importantly, your dad is a good and honest man and an incredible role model for all of us. Katie, Allison and I remain truly grateful for everything that you did to support the soldiers and families of Red Platoon and B Troop during our deployment to Afghanistan. No one could ever truly grasp the sacrifices of the military family, and I know that Andrew drew his strength from your love and your friendship and your support. And we are also grateful that he had that to draw from on October 3rd, 2009. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lieutenant General Thomas S. James, Jr., Commanding General of 1st United States Army. Wow, Stoney, you're a tough act to follow. That's awesome, awesome. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, family members, Warriors from Red Platoon, Bravo Troop 361 Cav. On behalf of a grateful nation, on behalf of the United States Army, and a really good friend of mine, Major General Randy George, who would love to be here today if he wasn't back in Afghanistan. I am honored and humbled to stand before true American heroes who fought so bravely in the unforgiving crucible of ground combat. Historians have tried for years to determine why soldiers fight for God and country, to achieve the mission and support of a larger operation. Ultimately, they fight for each other. A bond is formed that only few can imagine. Red Platoon, you are truly a band of brothers that endured the unimaginable and answered the call to duty above and beyond. Now to the Bunderman family, I'd like to start by thanking you for your service and your support for Andrew. They say that soldiering is an affair of the heart. As I've met you and, and seen your deep love for and pride in Andrew, I feel confident in saying that the heart of this outstanding soldier has been shaped by his family. It is humbling to meet families like yours who have entrusted our nation's army with the commitment of your loved ones. So in Romache, it is an honor to have you with us here today and to meet you today. Non-commissioned officers have always been the backbone of our army and define why we have the best army in the world. Your leadership, warfighting competence, and bravery inspired your teammates that day, enabled the team to overcome enormous size. Mr. Barr, Ms. Ms. DeBellis, thank you for being here today. Battles might be won by soldiers, but wars are won by the resolve of a nation. We in uniform are grateful for the support of your public service and as well the elected officials who support us. Brigadier General Thigpen, Command Sergeant Major Hillig, Colonels Brown and Zinn, Majors Portis and Richter, thank you for allowing me, if just for one day, to be part of the storied lineage of the mighty 4th Infantry Division. Thank you for your service and thank you for your leadership. Andrew, I am deeply aware that you would rather have eight of your friends and comrades here today than be presented with this award. That is the passion of an inspirational leader who truly loves his soldiers. But honoring and recognizing those who have acted with great valor is important. It has been said that our Army lives in the shadow of its traditions 
and that knowing the heroic deeds of our past soldiers is the best way to inspire our current warriors. So thank you for allowing me to be here today, and thank you for serving as an inspiration to us all. Shortly after the end of World War II, where he had served as a Supreme Allied Commander for the brutal fight in North Africa and the invasion of Normandy, General Dwight D. Eisenhower made a typical plain-spoken observation. The most terrible job in warfare, he said, is to be a young lieutenant leading a platoon on the battlefield. How true that is. Think of it. We pin a single gold bar on a 22-year-old's chest. We send him through some leadership and maneuver training. We assign him to be in charge of anywhere between 16 and 50 soldiers. And then, when history demands it, as it so often has, we tack on and add a degree of difficulty and send this young, untested leader out into the unforgiving crucible of ground combat, trusting he will effectively lead his platoon in the direst circumstances. How heavy that responsibility weighs. How haunting the losses when they come. How terrifying the question of whether you are up to the task. An Army Lieutenant in Vietnam once described his time as a platoon leader like this. I was trying to desperately learn what I was always, already supposed to know. Yet, for 243 years, the Army's most junior leaders have risen to the occasion time and time again. From Bunker Hill to Bull Run, from the Argonne Forest to Anzio, from Inchon to the I Train, from Kirkuk to Comdish. Our competent, capable, and courageous young officers have proven that that exceptional leadership is indispensable and that no weapon ever designed can beat it. Now let's fast forward to 2009. In a merciless valley in Afghanistan, on a vulnerable outpost surrounded like a fishbowl by high ground, Lieutenant Andrew Butterman was serving not only as Red Platoon leader, but as acting troop commander, when a force of three to four hundred Taliban fighters launched a pre-dawn attack on the 50 Americans at Cop Kiti, Andrew spread to the command post wearing only PT shorts and flip-flops. With power out and much of the communications down, he quickly established the only remaining communications platform in order to begin coordinating direct fire assets and air support. The men at Keating were in a tough fight from the start. They were outmanned, they were exposed to seemingly endless fire from Taliban fighters, targeting, targeting them from the surrounding ridgelines. Just 48 hours into the battle, the enemy had breached the perimeter and was moving through, the, through Cop Keating, systematically burning buildings to the ground. For a time, the situation was extremely dire. But like generations of young leaders before him, Andrew dug deep, drew on his training, and relied on his leadership skills. He ordered his men to collapse into a tight internal perimeter centered on two buildings that were not burning. On his orders, they pushed out teams to retake much of the outposts and to distribute ammunition. Over the course of an entire day of close combat, they expanded the perimeter, taking back an outpost that had been minutes away from being lost. Bunderman approved an offensive request from his non-commissioned officers that he believed would gain ground or momentum. He denied those he believed were too risky and would only result in the loss of more men. But most of all, Andrew coordinated a brilliant counter-strike that featured America's aviation might. At one point, at least 19 aircraft, Army attack helicopters, high-altitude drones, and Air Force A-10s 
and F-15s and one B-1 bomber were dropping an enormous amount of ordnance on the entrenched enemy fighting positions, reversing the tide of the battle. The insurgents began to retreat. The battle at Cop Keating reveals something about how our youngest, less experienced officers are able to triumph in the face of such overwhelming odds and adversity. We may place a lieutenant in charge of a platoon, but we pair him with an experienced NCO. Together they become formidable, maybe unbeatable. A team blending two things, inspirational leadership and, and as well veteran expertise. Lieutenant Bunderman and Staff Sergeant Roma Shea's leadership changed the outcome of that hellish October morning and undoubtedly helped save the lives of countless soldiers. That bond, that brotherhood exists today and will last a lifetime. The eight who perished at Keating weigh heavy. Justin Gallegos, Chris Griffin, Josh Hart, Josh Kirk, Stephen Mace, Vernon Martin, Michael Scusa, and Kevin Thompson. But without the counterattack Lieutenant Bunderman and Sergeant Romache led, God knows how that day would have ended. The bloodshed and outcome were unthinkable. Now in the hours after the battle had drawn to a close, a heartbroken Lieutenant Bunderman sat inside the aid station at Cop Keating drinking coffee warmed from an MRE heater. He told the medics he hadn't performed well enough and that he should have been in the center of the battlefield, not the fortified building running the radios. He said as the leader of the platoon, he should have risked more. He felt he should have been the first to die. To a man, everyone at Cop Keating that day believes the opposite. That Lieutenant Bunderman did more good in that command post than he could have anywhere else. That without his leadership, direction, and foresight, many more men would have been lost that day. That he had not been so methodical and calm under pressure by calling in targeting coordinates and air support, Keating would have been lost. But Andrew, Andrew's pain is why General Eisenhower's observation is so true. A leader feels the ultimate weight of every decision, every soldier on the battle roster, and every casualty. No matter how bravely he performed, how seamlessly he executes, he believes he should have done more. This is why leadership is so hard and why soldier, soldier Eni is truly an affair of the heart. I suspect that platoon leaders in the past Men who literally changed the course of history, one fought inch, hill, and trench line at a time, also questioned what more they could have done, what other choices they might have made. It is easy for our nation, which has the luxury of distance and reap the benefits of their valiant service, to call these men heroes. It's much harder label for them to accept. Well, what I know from my 34 years in the Army is that there is nothing more powerful than a well-led platoon with leaders motivated by a dual love, so powerful it can alter history, love for our nation and love for each other. Andrew, this is the leader you were, the Red Platoon. This is the leader you were on 3 October 2009. Every decision you made, every order you gave, was motivated by your devotion to this great nation and the soldiers that you dearly love. I said earlier that our NCOs are the backbone of this great army. So I'm going to close by quoting a wise staff sergeant who so succinctly summed up the role of Lieutenant Bunderman in the Battle of Camdish. With him, we lost eight men. Without him, we would have lost everyone. 
God bless all of you. I am honored and privileged to be in your presence. I am honored and privileged to wear the same uniform that you wear and have worn. Army strong, prepared and loyal. God bless all of you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated during the publishing of the orders and the award presentation. Thank you. Attention orders. By direction of the President, under the provisions of an act of Congress approved 9 July 1918 and amended 25 July 1963, the Distinguished Service Cross for Extraordinary Heroism in Action is awarded to First Lieutenant Andrew L. Lunderman for extraordinary heroism while engaged in an action against an enemy of the United States while serving as the acting commander of Troop B, 3rd Squadron, 61st Cavalry Regiment on 3 October 2009 in Afghanistan. On this date, Combat Outpost Keating and Observation Post Ritchie came under a complex and sizable enemy attack which breached the outpost perimeter. Understanding the extreme necessity for external communication to coordinate air support and casualty evacuation First Lieutenant Bunderman worked with two of his soldiers to set up the only remaining communications platform. Once communication was reestablished, he immediately coordinated with the Tactical Operations Center for direct fire support. As the squadron's supporting artillery was at its maximum range and could not adequately engage targets near Observation Post Pritchie, First Lieutenant Bunderman directed the mortar teams on Combat Outpost Keating to begin engaging targets at the nearby Observation Post allowing the squadron's supporting artillery to effectively engage enemy targets at the combat outpost. As the battle waged on, it became clear to him that the enemy was engaging the combat outpost from the nearby village and had captured the Afghan National Police Station. First Lieutenant Bunderman effectively directed his troops in direct fire assets and air support fire on the village, neutralizing a key strategic position of the enemy. Realizing his soldiers were distributed in extended outer positions, and the enemy had control of several positions in the combat outpost. He reallocated his forces and made the tactical decision to focus the attack on the enemy forces within the perimeter of the outpost. Having redirected his forces, he led a bold counterattack, which cleared the enemy from several critical positions and ultimately led to a successful defense of combat outpost Keating. First Lieutenant Bunderman's actions are in keeping with the highest traditions of military service, and reflect great credit upon himself, the 61st Cavalry Regiment, and the United States Army. Signed, 8 May 2018, Mark A. Milley, General, United States Army Chief of Staff, and Mark T. Esper, Secretary of the Army. rise for the playing and singing of the Army song and remain standing for the departure of the official party. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's ceremony. Please join Lieutenant General James, Sergeant Major Cook, and all our distinguished guests in the atrium for a reception and a chance to meet with Mr. Bunderman and his family. Freedom's Guardian, always ready, Army Strong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.